Good afternoon. This is Susan Ryan with the Greenhouse Project, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm excited about today's webinar because we are launching our Best Life webinar series. Best Life is the Greenhouse Project's signature memory care approach. And really excited to especially dive into one of the signature core principles of Best Life, and that is the dignity of risk. I can tell you as a nurse, I have had a, a real preoccupation with wanting to keep elders safe, especially those that are living with dementia. I think we have joked at times that uh, we'd like to bubble wrap everybody to keep them safe and really eliminate that element of risk. This week, I had the privilege of being at one of our greenhouse communities in West Orange, New Jersey. And I think for me, what was so exciting was to see the dignity of risk operationalized and some of the aha moments that this group had experienced by having gone through the best life memory care education and training. And so really excited to introduce this concept to you and more importantly, to introduce to you now our author, Ann Ellett who is the, um, the one who has put the best life approach together, building on the greenhouse core values, and who is a nurse practitioner, a dementia specialist, and somebody I have known for years and have the most uh, incredible respect for who she is as a person, but who she is as a real critical thinker in this space. And, Anne is, I'm proud to say, is now not just an esteemed colleague, but is an esteemed team member of uh, the Greenhouse Project. And bringing Anne on full-time has enabled us to go the distance and do some things that we had not been able to do. So, Anne, I'm going to just really turn it over to you right now so that you're able to leverage uh, the amount of time necessary to really give this topic its um, due diligence. Anne? And we will get Anne on in just a minute. Hi, can everyone hear me? We hear you now. That's awesome. Okay. All right. Um, I, I think I was mu muted, so thank you. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And this topic is, as Susan said, the dignity of risk. And I'm just kind of putting that question back out there to all of you on the uh, conference call today. What does dignity of risk mean to you? I'm going to ask all of you as we talk for the next few minutes about what it means to you as we get started, and then again towards the end of our time together. Has your meaning changed? Do you understand it any better or any differently? And I have a couple questions, or I have one question here that just to get started, I would appreciate it if all of you on the uh, computer could answer this question for us. It's, a, uh, it's something we'll be answering and talking about more later, but it's do you have outdoor space that is accessible to your residents who are living with dementia? So it's, uh, we'll just take maybe 30 seconds here. And so in your memory care community, do elders have direct access to outside walkways and our sitting areas? So if, if just a simple yes or no, and we'll talk more about it later in, in our time together. Okay. Good. All right. So, um, I think some of you, I know some of you in the line have heard me use the term dignity of risk before. Uh, any of you who've been through some best life training with me have heard me talk a lot about this. But to put it in context, as Susan said, 
Um, dignity of risk is one of the four core principles of the best life approach, which is an innovative way to view people living with dementia. And about a decade ago, the Greenhouse Project did a survey where they found out that well over 85% of the people living with them were affected by some type of dementia. If we can go to the next slide. So with this information that, and this, this is so consistent with probably where all of you are working, there are many studies showing that throughout all aspects of long-term care and into assisted living, that the majority of people living there have some cognitive changes. So with this information, with this data, the Greenhouse Project uh, wanted to step forward in an innovative way to offer the best care for these elders living with them who are affected by dementia. And I like to say that if if you had a nursing home or assisted living or some type of long-term care setting, and what if 85% of the people living there uh, had diabetes? Or what if 85% of the people living there had Parkinson's? Some other diagnosis, wouldn't you be stepping forward and developing a very intentional program to meet the needs? And we recognize that meeting the needs of people living with dementia is very complex. It's very complex. It seems that everybody these days claims to be an expert in dementia care. Um, we do Alzheimer's care, we do memory care. That's on almost every marketing brochure across the country. So the Greenhouse Project has a history of being innovative and disrupting the long-term care industry with their small home model. And they also looked around at the dementia care programs and said, we want to do it differently. We want to do it better. And so the best life approach was developed. It's also being adopted in other locations now outside of greenhouse homes. And if you're not with the greenhouse project and are interested after this uh, webinar in learning more about the best life approach, uh, you can contact us after the webinar. So what's unique about the best life approach? Well, the concept of person-centered care has been around for a long time, yet the accepted standard of care for people living with dementia is still far from what probably most of us would voluntarily seek out for the last portion of our life. This picture here and on the next slide also, it's like the new normal. You see people sitting in wheelchairs, um, really kind of closed off, sequestered away from the greater community, not a lot of connections to the outside world. And this has become the new normal. So while the term person-centered care continues to be used, there really has not been any profound changes in experiences for the person living with dementia. They often are still confined, isolated, and offered few opportunities for stimulation and new experiences. And if they express their frustration or desires, we know that they're at risk of receiving risky psychotropic medication. So we, we don't think this is okay. I'm pretty sure that most of you in the line don't think it's okay. It's not the way we would wanna be treated. And the next slide shows that there's there's really a national or really an international movement of people who are diagnosed with early dementia speaking up and they're saying we have some rights here and the many people are fearful to acknowledge that they have the diagnosis of dementia because they're fearful of how they'll be treated they're fearful of what will be taken away from them so there's this whole wonderful dialogue going on uh, from country to country, really. And they're saying, nothing about me without me. And as they look for their future, these seven things are the things that in a study of over 200 people newly diagnosed with dementia, that they came up and said that these were their hopes for their future, that they could still have meaningful relationships, 
They wanted opportunities to participate, not to be sequestered away. They wanted to continue to grow. People living with dementia can still learn new skills. They wanted to be seen as a whole person, to not have the, the diagnosis define them. They wanted to have purpose. They wanted to be able to take risks, and they wanted to be able to be seen as able. And honestly, that's not the way myself as a nurse has been trained to look at people living with dementia. We've been trained to first uh, look at their inabilities and really let the diagnosis define them. So what is unique and culture changing about the best life approach is that it asks all of us to look at our own fears and misperceptions of dementia, which can devalue elders and prevent them from living full lives. This can lead to something called surplus safety. And we all have to talk about this as professionals who want to offer the best experience, the best support. We have to be able to talk about these things. And uh, we know that having a, a normal um, existence, a normal environment, might mean taking some risks. So that's what we call the dignity of risk. And I'd also like to actually change that to the dignity of risk and rewards. We'll be talking about rewards in a few minutes, uh, a little bit later. But the next slide summarizes the two areas of focus of Best Life. First, we're asked to look at our own misperceptions, our own biases, our own fears about caring for people living with dementia. And then the second focus of Best Life is how do we change the culture? How can we do this differently? So as you can see on the next slide, I'm, I'm gonna ask all of you to just take a moment and since research is showing that if you live to 85, there's close to a 50% chance of developing some kind of dementia. And people are living so long these days. Many of us on this phone will be living in well into our 80s and 90s. So take a moment and, and think in your mind, if you were an elder living with dementia somewhere, would you still have hopes and dreams? What would you hope for? How would you like to be seen? How would you like to be known? Do you want to be uh, seen as the, the old woman sitting in the wheelchair over in the corner who can't talk anymore? Or do you want to be seen as the woman who is living with dementia and has the best cookie recipe and loves to go outside and smell the flowers and will hold your hand when you come and sit next to her. So there are different ways that we can acknowledge and see people. And if we, uh, on the next slide, so if we just think for a moment about what our hopes and dreams are, and think about one thing that you consider important or part of your own normal world, and it could be an experience, or it could be an object, maybe driving your car, maybe um, having friends over for dinner, maybe going into the kitchen and cooking your favorite recipe. So what do these values and concepts represent? And I think here on the slide, the next um, thing on the slide, they, they represent choices and opportunities. And we would say, when is it okay to take these away from a person? When is it okay? Well, we like to say it's never okay. So as we're talking about this, think about your own workplace environment and think about what's been taken away from people who come to live there. So much of life in long-term care is about taking things away from the people who live there. They may have to give up having a private bedroom or a private bathroom. They may have to give up their garden or being able to go outside whenever they want to. They may have to give up strolling out to their own mailbox or walking their dog or sitting with their cat in the evening or going to the refrigerator anytime they want and getting a snack. So we all want good outcomes for our residents, our elders, but sometimes our own fears or maybe it's the policies and the procedures of where you work, mandate that all, for example, all outside doors are locked, that residents are encouraged to stay in wheelchairs all day, 
reduce their independent walking and possible falling because we all feel so bad. We all hate it when someone does have a fall. But this can result in surplus safety and excessive disability. One policy at a time gets layered on. As you can see in the next slide, this is just a, an example of many, many um, safety signs. And when you, when you think of layering so many policies and procedures and fears and misperceptions on top, pretty soon the resident who's living with dementia is really unable to do much. So the next slide, as I said, as a nurse, we emphasize, I was trained to emphasize loss and disabilities rather than focus on retained abilities and skills. And please don't think that I'm saying that safety isn't important because of course it is. But if the most important thing that's measured is fall and nobody ever measures how long it's been since someone had the opportunity to go outside and sit in the sunlight and the fresh air, that's a bad outcome too, but somehow that never gets measured. So I'm a nurse, as I said, and I'll confess to you being very fearful when we start talking about getting people out of wheelchairs and encouraging them to move around independently or when we talk about unlocking doors. But once I really examined it, from the perspective of the person living with dementia, I realized that my fears were limiting them in unnecessary ways. The next slide here, um, I, I hope that many of you on the call today are familiar with Dr. Al Power, but in case I wanted to put these references up for all of you, He's a geriatrician. He's written several books about dementia and about our misperceptions of people living with dementia. And um, Dementia Beyond Drugs uh, is, is a, a really profound one that talks about decreasing psychotropic medications. But he also, on his website, has a blog and it's a four-part blog, so you see the references there, called Hidden Restraint. And when he says hidden restraint, he's talking about locked doors. And in this blog, and I hope many of you will go on to read it, he talks about a gentleman named Henry who lived in a memory care community, and the front door was locked, and he wanted to go out the front door. And the social worker taught him the combination to the keypad on the door, and Henry started going out by himself. Well, I don't know how that makes all of you feel. I know when I first read it, I, I could feel me getting very nervous. I mean, this is like, this isn't good. You mean Henry, who has dementia, is allowed to go outside by himself? But that is the case. That is the situation. So the next slide um, shows that we have so many locked doors in our environment. And often people will say to me, well, they just have to ask to go outside and we'll, we'll open the door for you, for them. But we know that that's an obstacle. If the door isn't easily accessible, sometimes on a nice day, can it even be propped open? So people can go out onto your patio. Um, so it's inviting them out. Uh, it's difficult sometimes for people living with dementia to initiate things. Doesn't mean they don't want to or they wouldn't get enjoyment from it, but sometimes it's difficult for them to initiate an action. And so if they have to go find someone or request to have the door unlocked, that's really an obstacle. And often when I visit around the country in various nursing homes, I see that in many memory care areas, they're rather confining. They might be a, a locked or a secured unit at the end of a hallway in an assisted living 
or a specific wing of a nursing home. And just the fact that they're confined to a certain area, I think it would make me feel very anxious, very claustrophobic to know that I couldn't get out of that. The next slide, I thought this was a good photo of how I might feel. I don't look like that, by the way. <laughs> but I thought that's how I would probably feel. You could go to the nicest hotel in the world, really luxurious and nice, but if once you got inside, the door was locked behind you and you couldn't get out, it would be a real panicky feel. We're not used to having those kinds of um, limitations and restrictions on us. All of you on the phone, just take a minute and think, how normal is it to put someone behind a locked door? How would you feel, do you think, if you had a locked door? So then the next slide is, um, again, there's just, they've, they've come up with so many different ways to, to lock doors these days, but they, the point is that they all create a barrier, an obstacle to the resident or the elder being able to have a natural, easy flow in and out of the environment. And it also says we're the ones to decide when you can and who can go outside. We'll tell you when it's okay to go outside. So let's see, uh, Meg, do we have the results of the uh, question that we asked? Okay, so wonderful. So it's wonderful. It looks like the vast majority of you on the call have uh, outside walking and sitting areas. So that's, that's fantastic. So now, uh, I just ask you in your mind to say, is it completely accessible? And um, so is it unlocked? And maybe not the, maybe not the front door out your, at the front door, but maybe to the door to these walking areas. Are they always unlocked? Are they always open? And I don't know how many of you would say, yes, it's, it's always available, but I often find that really lovely outside areas are closed off uh, for much of the time, unless there's some kind of an organized activity out there. They'll they'll tell me, oh no, we use the patio a lot. We we do a barbecue every Friday afternoon out there, and that's fantastic. But I'm what about the other six days of the week? So um, in so in your mind, just think, are there barriers to people getting to use that outside area? And so when we talk about the dignity of risk, what do we mean by dignity? It's the state of being worthy of honor or respect. And so if we say we don't respect you enough to be able to have access to go outside, uh, we don't think you're worthy of that, you have a cognitive change, so you can't make the decision of when to go outside. That's really not showing dignity. And I know I, I currently, I live in California, Southern California, and the weather is pretty nice and mild here year round. And so people in other parts of the country, they often will tell me, well, you don't understand. Uh, it gets so hot where we are, or oh, we have terrible winters, and we can't have people going outside. And that's um, that's very reasonable. Um, and I, I just want to tell you about uh, one of the places near Phoenix, Arizona, that I recently was, and we did the best life training there. And one of the caregivers there pretty much said to me there's no way I'm unlocking the doors to the patio because it's too dangerous for the residents. They can't make that decision of when to go outside. It's over 100 degrees here for days at a time. We're not unlocking our doors. So first of all, I wanna say that her fears were not unfounded. 
uh, she would almost be irresponsible if she wasn't concerned about that. So that's a very good thing and a very um, appropriate thing for her to be concerned about the residents being outside in over 100 degree heat. But after taking the best life training, we had a great discussion. And she told me that she could see that maybe she didn't have the right if she really believed in person-centered care to be the one to decide when and who could go outside. And she acknowledged that she wouldn't want to be kept inside for days and weeks at a time just because it's very hot outside. So she worked with her team to collaborate in a plan to oversee the patio space. And it's really a lovely patio just right outside this greenhouse home. And she worked with her team to collaborate on a plan to oversee the patio space. And she made sure that there were chairs in the shade and a big water jug out there every day. They started buying popsicles. And so residents got to go outside and have popsicles on a hot day. And last time I was there, the patio was being used pretty continuously, but very responsibly so. She and other Staff members were keeping a close eye that no one was out there too long or not out there in the hot sun. So the um, the next slide is what I call the the risk and reward. And I had an interesting experience at a assisted living memory care that I was visiting, and I was in the dining area. And we could hear this banging. And I said to the team members, I said, what's going on here? What's this banging? And they said, oh, that's Mrs. B. Uh, she finished her lunch, and she likes to go back to her room after lunch. But she always goes in there and falls. So we locked her door so she can't go in there because we don't want her to fall. Well. If we, I think most of us here on the call, we could say that that probably wasn't the best way to approach that problem. Although they, they were well-meaning, they were coming from the point of they didn't want Mrs. B to fall and get injured. They wanted to be responsible. They wanted to keep her out where they could keep an eye on her. But what were they doing? They were denying her the right to go into her room, her own room, when she desired. They were denying her the right to have that choice. It also could be considered a restraint by not allowing her to go into her room and it locked her away from her personal, personal belongings. And I can tell you how Mrs. B felt about this. She was pretty darn angry. Her language was not the best. <laughs> she was letting people know how she felt about this as she rammed her wheelchair into her locked door. So the team came together and they could recognize that they really, this was not a good solution. They were denying Mrs. B her rights. And uh, while we none of us wanted her to fall, we, this wasn't the solution that we should do. So they, they came together and they um, had another um, team uh meeting about this was her right who was i mean it's a very natural thing for people to want to go back to their own bed after lunch and have a rest and we couldn't deny that for her was there a way that we could leave the door open so we could keep an eye on her could we set up a team a rotating team uh solution where people would come by every 10 minutes or so and just crack the door and take a peek and make sure she was in no distress. Um, could we go in with her and help her get settled in the bed maybe? So if she was transferring and had some weakness that she would not be at risk while she was transferring. So they figured it out and, um, and they were able to uh, escort Mrs. B back to her room to take her nap and she was it was a much better solution than locking her out of her door. So she had some risk, but she also had some reward when the team came together. So the next slide, though, shows us that 
don't we wish that we could promise that when someone entrusts their loved one with us, that they're not going to get hurt? Um, we uh, so often the the family members they're saying, my mom's had some bad falls. What do, can you guarantee she won't fall here? And it hurts to be able to say no. We cannot guarantee, but we have great safety measures in place. Um, but we cannot guarantee. Because if we guaranteed, what would we be doing? We'd be tying her in bed all the time. And that has its own problems, obviously. So we can't guarantee. We can't bubble wrap, as Susan said. Um, but we can together as a team with open eyes come together in a very individualized and personal way for each of your elders or residents and say, what can we do that can give them a uh, choice? And knowing that, there might be some risk, but to not allow them to have any risk or any choice is not a good outcome. So the next slide is personal for me because I always tell people when I'm living with you with dementia, please, my fear would be if I lived someplace that wouldn't let me go outside. So even though I know I might go outside and fall, um, please let me go outside. It's very important to me. I love to garden. And so that would be uh, the dignity of risk uh, when I'm living with you. And please don't deny me being able to get outside. So I don't know if uh, people are starting to have some questions, but usually about this time when I'm talking about this, I get a question and somebody says, well, so what are you saying? Are you just saying that we should unlock all of our doors and let everyone do everything they want to all the time? Is that what you're saying? And it's not what I'm saying. Um, because of course we're still responsible. Of course we still want safe outcomes. So I say keep calm and um, look around you with fresh eyes. The next slide. And I think when you go back to your workplaces, look around you and look at the people who live there and say, what would be meaningful for this person? What could I enable them to do? And even though it might have some, some risk involved. And I think we have to be honest about our fears also. We have to be realistic. If we don't acknowledge and talk about our own fears of letting people go outside or unlocking the doors or letting them go back to their room where we can't always keep an eye on them, if we don't talk about that it's often our own fears that are keeping people from having these choices. So I'm challenging you to have fresh eyes uh, and to talk openly about your fears. Because the next slide, I don't know um, if any of you on the uh, conference are old enough to remember the times when, you know, we tied people in bed, serious restraints here. Um, I was trained as a new nurse to do this. Um, there were a variety of different restraints that we could use from uh, the posy vest and the arm restraints and um, the lap buddies and or just wheel their wheelchair up to a table and lock it so they can't get out so there were lots of ways and this was acceptable care and when we look back on that we go oh my gosh you know that's so horrible to think that we did that but uh, people who did that they thought that they were keeping people safe we also know that you can't do that now, that we have to be able to um, offer people choice and more freedom. But I remember the nurses when we began to take their strengths away, and many nurses were saying, there's no way we can take care of these people if we can't tie them bed. There's no way. Well, guess what? Um, it's happened. Um, very seldom are physical restraints used anymore. And thank goodness, people started challenging that and asking questions. So 
So we have to believe it can happen. You, when you look around the place where you work today, you have to believe that you can make some changes. Does it mean that you can go to your director and get policies changed this week? Probably not. But I challenge all of you to initiate conversations, to look at it by resident by resident and say, what would be meaningful for this resident that they have not been allowed to do? What have we taken away from this um, resident? So the next slide has some suggestions. And again, I'm not saying throw open all your doors. All elders can do whatever they want all day, all night. But here are some suggestions. And again, it's, it's beginning to move the needle in the direction of more freedom, more choice. And remember the stigma that's attached to the diagnosis of dementia. When someone receives that diagnosis, so often uh, many of their uh, freedoms and choices are taken away from them immediately as if everyone who has the label of dementia is all the same. Well, if you have the label of dementia, you must not be able to turn the stove on, drive, make phone calls, use the computer, or go outside. And, and you know, every person is an individual. So the first suggestion is be sure that all elders are not restricted because of the actions of one. Is that patio door locked because an elder had a fallout there last year? Remember, elders fall inside also. So that's often what I hear is, oh, they can't go out unless we have a staff member out there with them because someone got hurt. So we keep it locked and we use the patio for special events or something. So think about, I challenge you to think about that. And um, it's not fair to restrict everyone because of the actions of one elder. The second suggestion is when a person living with dementia wants to do something, whether it's stand up, move around, or go for a walk outside, these are all natural needs and activities that any of us would want access to. Um, a friend that I worked with, his father, who was living with dementia, was put in a very confining space. His father was a large, active man. And he spent his whole day going from one door rattling it, walking down the hall, rattling the next door, rattling the next door, rattling the next door. He wanted out. And um, he ended up, unfortunately, receiving some um, pretty strong medications to calm him down, when perhaps there could have been a way to arrange to take him out every day for a walk. So um, the next uh, suggestion is every one of us walks every day wherever and whenever we wish. This is normal behavior. It's not wandering. It's exploring. It's getting oriented to their environment. It's curiosity. Or it's a natural desire to want to be able to leave and walk out the front door. So it's not uh, exit-seeking behavior. It's just normal behavior that probably any of us would do if we were in a place where we were perhaps disoriented, we perhaps didn't understand why we were there, and we would be exploring all of the doors to find out where they went and did they open and could we get outside. So by calling it wandering or exit seeking, we're making it seem like it's not a normal adult activity or behavior. When we take away choices, we can't be offering person-centered living. So I ask you to just, again, it's that individual, that deep knowing of the individual uh, residents and elders. And security is not just physical, but it's also emotional and psychological. If, if you lived someplace and the door was locked, would you feel secure? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you be uneasy with that? Um, so it's more than just physical security. And then I challenge all of you to believe it's possible, because I think if you do, if you're willing to have those conversations, ask those questions, um, things don't change overnight, but all of us together, we can move the needle in the right direction. All right, I think that, that uh, pretty much wraps it up. And 
I ask you all to think about change. Here's a picture of, um, I think it's, it's just Maisie, I think, who lives in one of the greenhouse homes and the elders just dearly love her. So I love that photo. Susan, did you want to, um, is there anything you'd like to sure. add? Yeah, so let me, um, a couple things. I want to, um, first of all, invite anybody. I've seen a couple comments come through our um, chat line. So if you've got other comments or questions for Anne, please put them in there now. And while you're doing that, I want to just kind of echo a couple things that Anne said, and it reminded me of a couple things that happened uh, while I was at uh, Green Hill in West Orange, New Jersey, when you were talking about um, the concern of taking somebody outside because it's cold in New Jersey, it can get rather cold in the winter, and their best life champion recalled the story. She says, so here's what we did. It was cold outside, but how fun was it for the elders that wanted to go outside to actually put on their coats, their gloves? And we went outside. We felt the cold air. We talked about how cold it was. There, it was snowing at the time, and we all kind of shared some, you know, stories about what it felt like. Just, it was probably 10 or 15 minutes that we were out there, but it was a normal activity. And she said it was age appropriate. It, it felt so good. And then we came inside, and somebody said, "I feel like some hot chocolate right now." And that's what they did. They had some hot chocolate. But to really just kind of seize that opportunity there and the spontaneity of that and the, the normal part of going outside with your coat on and so forth. Um, the other thing that I want to share, and again, this is as a result of really being um, more provoked to think about how can we instead of, and, and saying why not instead of, um, all the reasons why we shouldn't do some things. They had a, a, a charming little lady living with dementia. I happened to notice that she was wearing high heels as she was uh, walking around the house. And so as I was, I said, that's interesting. I said, does she always wear those? And they said, oh, yeah. Forget about trying to put Flora in different shoes. She's got to have her high heels on. And physical therapy has come in and said, she's a fall risk. you got to take those shoes off. But to take those shoes away from Flora would rob her of her dignity and her choice. And guess what? Flora is walking quite well. In fact, I think there's something about the high heels. That's her normal, and she doesn't quite know how to, to walk without them. So let me I get to that some story. of the, Yeah, let me get to some of the questions that we have coming in. Um, so it says, here's a comment, you say not to use terms such as wandering and exit, ex, excuse me, exit seeking. How do you talk about the anxiety that some people have about not feeling at home, even when they are in their own home? Hmm. Um, talk about the anxiety someone feels. Say that Say that again, Susan. So it, it sounds like we call it wandering or exit seeking, but oftentimes when mm -hmm. someone is living in their own home, it sounds like there's a level of anxiety that whether it's exit seeking or wandering or whatever you might call it, it seems like something is not right. And so how, how would we address that anxiety, I guess is the, the question. Yeah. Um, that's difficult because as again as every person is so individual and as they have an awareness of their changing understanding as their cognitive uh, abilities do change it can make it can create a lot of anxiety um, if they are a person who needs to be physically active and walk a lot I hope that they have that opportunity. It's hard if they're in their own home, but if a person needs to walk a lot, keeping them confined can really only add to their anxiety. And also, 
I'm I'm reminded of a of a woman that came to live with a place at a place where I worked a few years ago and she was very anxious and she paced around constantly and all she would say is I want to go home. I want to go home. I want to go home. And we we tried very hard to distract her. We tried very hard to engage her in different things. And she was very hard to distract. She would she was not sitting to eat. She was not sleeping well. She was very anxious. And it was a caregiver, really, who came up with such a wonderful idea, I thought. And um, she said, well, has everyone told her that we love her and she's safe? And so all of us together delivered the same message to Betty. Betty, we love you. You're safe here. Betty, we love you. You're safe here. And so no matter who interacted with her, she got that same message. And within about three weeks, she had calmed down considerably and was um, able to be engaged and able to sleep and things like that. But it is hard. Um, anxiety, because they often have that awareness that they're not quite understanding what's going on in their environment. And they need a lot of reassurance. So we've got lots of questions coming in. Let me give you the next one. How do facilities lawyers view all of this? Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I do do legal nurse consulting, so I'll tell you I get a lot of cases that people want me to review where there have been falls or, I hate to use the word elopement. And um, so, again, I think it's so important that consistently family members hear we are going to do everything we can to keep your loved one safe, but we cannot guarantee that she will not have a fall or get injured. Just any of us who've been parents have seen how quickly any of our children when they're young can bang into something. I mean, you know, they have nothing to do with being bad parents and um, your child looks like they've been beat up. So it can happen very quickly. I was in a place where a 90-year-old woman just was standing there talking to another woman and just right in front of my eyes, about three feet away, she just keeled forward and hit her head on the edge of a table. So as all of us reached for her, she just went ahead and fell down. So um, what we have to be able to, to show and document is what are our safety practices. Our safety practices are while we allow residents to have choice, we check the outside patio on a regular basis. We have a look to the surface of the, uh, the patio floor and removed any obvious obstacles. We have chairs and things that they can support themselves with out there at frequent intervals. Um, so you have to be able to speak to what you are doing to um, Keep people safe. You, you never want to say we we believe in the dignity of risk. So it was her choice to go outside, and if she fell or if she got heat stroke, well, that was her choice. No, of course that's not what we're saying at all. We're saying here are the safeguards we have in place. We honor her choice, and here's how we supported her to have that and keep her safe. So you always want to be able to speak to what your uh, safety program is, but remember your own fears. Remember, look at your policies and procedures, and I can almost assure you that many of them were generated after a bad outcome, a bad event. And so now, no longer is X, Y, and Z allowed to happen. And it's having those conversations again with your team, with your risk management department, saying, you know, this is not the life that our residents deserve. They deserve to have more choice. Here's what we're going to do to keep them safe, but we want to be able to expand what their choices are. I'm going to just read uh, one of the comments that somebody wrote here. I, I love it. The person says, the bottom line is, what does it mean to be human? Who wants to continue living if they have no opportunity to make choice and no freedom to go outside or where they want? And I, I think that's a, a wise, wise comment. Let me read um, yeah. one other thing that I, there was a, a question here. Um, how do we help staff get past fear? 
and uh, focus on the regulations? I love that question um, because we all have fears. I do too. Um, you know, I was trained as a nurse, no falls on my shift. So, you know, that's why I was uh, evaluated as a good nurse if nobody fell. So we all have fears. Um, we have to, I mean, I just keep the vision of those restraints of tying people down. And I go, if we didn't start asking questions and saying there has to be a better way, that's what we still would be doing. We have to challenge ourselves. We have to ask questions. And so again, I think the more we can talk about it, I love that you use the word fears. I think that we have to address it head on. We all have fears here. Um, but the places who have started giving their residents more choice, they're not having more falls or having more bad outcomes. What they're having is less um, challenging actions and uh, from their elders because their elders have more variety. They're, they're getting more natural light, which helps them sleep better. I mean, you know, so it's like there's a cascade of benefits that can happen with time when you start offering more choice. But I, I think the most important thing is what you said, is just be talking to your staff. What are we afraid of? Let's just talk about it. It's, it's the elephant in the room. What are we afraid of? What are the fears? Are you afraid you're gonna get in trouble by your administrator? Are you afraid you're gonna get in trouble by your supervisor? Um, well, what we need to do is show them, here's the plan we have, so our residents can now have more choices. Here's what we've done to help keep them safe. We can never guarantee it, but we've expanded their choices and um, hopefully improved the quality of their day. You know, as I'm reading some of the other questions, so many of them have a lot to say about, you know, the, the fear of whether it's being sued, whether it's the regulators, whether it's just the falls, you know, the, the bad outcomes that might happen should somebody fall. And I love what you're saying about really addressing our fears, and it has to start with ourselves. And we use a powerful construct in the best life training and in actually all of the greenhouse training, and that's around beliefs, behaviors, and systems. Do you want to speak a little bit uh, to that, Anne? Sure. Um, in the greenhouse homes, we talk about belief, behaviors, and systems, comparing traditional belief, behaviors, and systems to what we might consider that are innovative practices. And so using myself as an example, as a nurse, my traditional belief as a nurse is that I look to someone and I immediately look to their disabilities. And I assume if someone is frail looking and sitting in a wheelchair that they're unable to, and then I just have a long list of things they're probably unable to do. That's my belief because that's how I've been trained. My behavior is then that I'm going to not offer them opportunities because I'm going to think, well, she has dementia. She's not going to be able to uh, participate in this or she's not going to, you know, it's not going to make any difference if she goes outside. And then the system is going to support me in that because the system is probably going to have a policy and a procedure that's going to say, um, you know, if, if a resident requests to go outside, she may go outside for supervised, short supervised visits or something like that. That's the policy and procedure. Instead of then we would contrast it with what we call the new beliefs, behaviors, and systems. So if our new beliefs are that this is a whole person here who has a whole uh, life, is uh, capable of many things, and um, I need to get to know this person and deep knowing and find out what their abilities and capabilities and interests and preferences are, then I will see them for what they can still do and what they can uh, future participate in. And my behavior then is I'm going to offer them more choices and I'm going to challenge the system to say, our residents want to go outside. Now that we have the doors open, we're seeing them out there. They enjoy it. We want to change the procedure so the door is unlocked, but we have good supervision out there. We have other things to help keep them safe, but that's the new system. 
so yes, it's, it's, so it's being aware of what we bring. And often the, if you attend the next webinar on the power of normal, uh, where I talk about the culture and the stigma and that it's so ingrained in us that that's the first place we go when we visually see an older person uh, living with dementia. We first focus on all the things they can't do. So let me give one more question, and um, then we'll kind of close it out. It's a common question. Most of the places I've worked also have very limited staff. A lot of the solutions offered seem to involve increased time with staff. How can a typical long-term care implement these changes if management is not agreeable to providing more staffing? Yeah, really good question. I appreciate that because that is the real world that most of us live in. Um, and we, we can't, I don't, I don't have a magic wand. I wish I did. So what I ask you to do is, is um, one, believe it can happen. So you're going to demonstrate your belief by continuing to have conversations, by continuing to advocate for your residents, your elders, and say this would be meaningful for them. Um, what I often hear is people will make these broad stereotype um, descriptions of people living with dementia, and they'll look at a group and they'll go, well, they won't care. They don't know, you know, and it, it breaks my heart because we never want to take anyone, a group of people as a group, instead we want to say, well, what would be meaningful for Susan or what would be meaningful for Anne? And so you have to continue to have those conversations. As I said, I don't think the systems are going to change overnight. Um, you want to prepare yourself for the conversation by saying, I think this would be meaningful for Susan if she could get outside. Um, we would like to, uh, when the door is open, we see her uh, trying to get out and uh, we would like to make it accessible to her. So here's the system that we would like to consider putting in place. Um, maybe it's two hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon that the door is unlocked and open. I mean, actually propped open, what a concept. So um, these doors are so heavy that the elders usually cannot open them themselves, even if they wanted to. So it's, it, it can be incremental. It means you continue to have the dialogue. You continue to advocate uh, for individual elders. It doesn't have to be you advocate for them as a group. You have to uh, show that you know them well and know what would be meaningful for an individual and say, how can we make this happen? How can we make this happen? Uh, and 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 then, um, like the previous question, being honest to say, I, we know we're fearful about this. We know we're scared. Um, we know, but we know that also that things are changing. Things are changing. We're not tying people down like we used to 20 years ago. So we know things are changing. Um, how could we move towards having this uh, be available for this specific resident? Well, thank you so much for those thought-provoking ideas, Anne. And I think, you know, really understanding and knowing each person as an individual is kind of where it starts, as well as addressing our own fears and misperceptions. Just to let you know, that cute little puppy was um, is Miles, our uh, mm. favorite uh, dog that's at the Bell Mead community in Paragould, Arkansas. And Miles is not that little puppy anymore. Miles is growing up. But... Um, I happened to have been there in March and, and saw Miles in action and saw the incredible joy that brought to the elders there. And stay tuned. There are lots of stories about what that community did around the dignity of risk and really ensuring that Miles as a, a, a puppy was able to grow up in the greenhouse home and really engage with elders in a meaningful way. So as Ann mentioned, we are excited. We have focused the last two years with Anne's help to get Best Life implemented into greenhouse communities, and we're still on a path to make that happen. But this year, by bringing Anne on full-time, we are, are really endeavoring to um, expand our offerings so that Best Life can come to your community as well. So if you're interested in bringing Best Life to your community, um, go to our website. We've got a whole page that um, talks about Best Life, a little more about what it is. 
send us an email. There's the email address, or feel free to give us a call, and we'd be happy to talk to you about how you can bring best life to your community. I mentioned that this was the first in a series of webinars for, around best life and made reference to the power of normal. It's another best life core principle. It's a powerful, powerful principle. And um, that will happen May 21, um, 2019, not 2109. <laughs> um, and that will be at uh, 3 p.m. as well. And we are starting our, we have been launching a, um, well, we have a workshop that's coming up in May in Loveland, Colorado. If you really want to get in and, and see a greenhouse community, um, this would be a wonderful opportunity. That first day is an overview uh, from 10 a.m. to 4, and you can find more information out at the on our website. The second day is a deeper dive, and there is a fee for that day, and you can get the details on our website. And finally, this is the year that Greenhouse is launching uh, 2.0. Best Life is part of the 2.0 initiative, but there are several other new things that we're going to talk about on May 1 at 3 o'clock. It's a webinar that will give you the highlights of what is the Greenhouse Project 2.0 initiative. So stay tuned. Join us for those other opportunities, webinars, and workshops, and we hope to continue a conversation with you. Thanks, everyone, for joining us, and Anne, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and experiences. Take care. Thank you, everybody.